I would like to introduce you to our first keynote speaker. Now, this lady I met again a few months ago, and I was on one of her panels and I watched her talk and she was absolutely fabulous. Um, not only is she fabulous, but she is super duper modest. Um, and she, she's working for a healthcare company and she was previously the chief scientific officer for Chevron, but I would now like to introduce you to the COO of Chevron, Dr. Natalie Pankova. Up you come. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming to this event. Uh, thank you to the lovely Natalie and Susan for organizing it. Uh, you guys have done a fabulous, fabulous job, and I think it's going really well. Um, you guys have I don't know, double, triple, quadrupled your capacity since last time. So obviously very successful. So I work for a company called Shavam, and I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit today about owning your genome with blockchain technology. So we're going to cover at a very high level things like genomics, blockchain, precision medicine, and why we care about all of those things. Um, just a disclaimer, the opinions and, and the messaging today is just my own and not the company's. Uh, before I do that, I've been asked to give a little bit of an intro about myself and my journey and kind of how I got to where I am today. Uh, so as Natalie mentioned, thank you very much. I am now the, the Chief Operating Officer for Shavam. Uh, before that, I was the Chief Scientific Officer, so kind of working more on the science and R&D side. And my background is in operations and R&D for biotech and health tech companies, um, as well as uh, I also lead the kind of the healthcare um, initiatives here with the Government Blockchain Association in London. And so my journey getting here has been anything but straightforward. Uh, basically, I started my kind of first entry into healthcare with the federal government in Canada. Uh, when I was quite young, I started work in the occupational health and safety branch of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So this was really fun for me as a young student. I got to work with a lot of doctors, uh, psychologists, nurses, and I thought, hey, healthcare is really cool. Let me try this. And so I decided to study an undergrad in biochemistry with an intention of going to medical school. However, when I was doing this, I also realized that I kind of liked research. I did a little bit of research work. And so not really knowing what I wanted to do at the end of my degree, I decided to take a year off. And I did some brief stints in pharma and clinical work. Um, and what I learned here is that I really liked the intersection of the two. I liked helping uh, bring treatments forward, so doing drug development. But I also liked working with the patients and, uh, and really working on that human side of the work. And so again, still not knowing what I wanted to do, I went back to school, uh, studied medical research. And, uh, and here, when I was at the bench, I realized I didn't really like being at the bench. I wanted to, to bring more of an impact to the healthcare community, to the patient community, um, that, than I was doing with just straight bench work. And then I went and um, did a little bit of, of work in nonprofit, did some operations, business development on my own free time as a volunteer, and then decided to apply that work and uh, join a biotech, basically. And in, during that time is when I did things like uh, business development, investor relations, um, operations, R&D, and I really, really enjoyed helping bring some of those technologies to the market, so helping commercialize treatments for patients. I also did a lot of teaching on the side all throughout my career, um, and then moved into health tech, kind of more related work, so things like diagnostics, precision medicine, uh, AI technologies, and so last year, when the folks at Shavam, the, the co-founders, reached out to me, it was only when, when I was just learning what blockchain was. I, I had heard of it, I kind of understood it for healthcare, but I could understand the impact that it could have um, for, for things like genomics, like precision medicine, and having been in that space, I saw some of the challenges uh, with uh, transacting, moving around data, health data specifically, some of the roadblocks, particularly working in hospital settings and government uh, settings. You can see the slowdowns, the silos, and things like that. So I so thought, hey, this was really awesome. We can use this technology for securing healthcare data. And so I kind of jumped into that um, kind of full force in January, and it's been really exciting ever since. 
And so one of the things that I would say, and people always ask me, well, what are you doing in blockchain? How did you get in here? Um, it's, it's obviously been unplanned, right? And one of the, the things that I've learned from my experience is it, it really humbled me in terms of, of planning your career. And so uh, for me, as somebody who used to be this kind of control freak person, who knew exactly what I wanted to do and a, a, an exact way to get there, I realized there's more than one way to get somewhere. And I still get to make an impact now for patients, um, helping run a startup. Um, and I feel like I get to make more of an impact than if I was myself directly treating a patient on a daily basis. So, and it's different for, for everybody, but this is kind of my takeaway from it. And another thing is if you're gonna ask me now, five years from now, where am I gonna be? I will tell you that I have no idea. Because if you had asked me five years ago whether I was gonna be in blockchain or whether I was gonna be in tech at all, I would have said, probably you're crazy because I never really liked tech. I'm not a developer myself. Um, I, I, so I never liked coding per se, right? And, and both of my parents are hardcore coders, so I can say that. They used to try to force me to study things like HTML and Visual Basic, and I was like, no. Uh, so, so it was, it was kind of really remarkable for me to actually think about this and, and have a, a realization that this is where I'm now and this is what I'm doing. Um, so as, if you want any suggestions about your career, um, I would just say be open to the opportunities because sometimes they'll hit you right in the face and, and if you don't capture in that moment, you, it might pass you by and you'll never realize. All right, so that's enough about me. Fun stuff now, so genomics, blockchain, precision medicine, what does all this mean and how is it related? So first, genomics. What is genomics? Genomics is basically the study of your genome. Your genome is your complete set of DNA. It's essentially a code. It's a biological code and it makes you who you are. So it's the biological material that exists within all the cells in your body. And it's made up of four bases and those bases are alternating in different combinations in different people. And so uh, people have a unique code in terms of how their bases are organized. But it's not that unique because most people have generally the same uh, base pairs, but there's slight variations. And that's what makes us all different. So if you've ever kind of heard of some of these companies, they're what we call direct-to-consumer genomics companies. So things like Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, basically they're companies that offer a service and product where you can get information about your genetics and your genomics. And the way it works is you order a kit online, it comes to your door, you submit a sample, that sample gets sent off to a facility where complicated machines and algorithms basically read that code, and then you're provided a report online about what your genetic code is um, in, the forms, uh, in the form of answers to, to some of the questions you might have about healthcare. This is really what it looks like. This is code, it's lines and lines and lines of code, but within that code are genes, basically the, the, the secrets to your ancestry, your appearance, um, everything from the color of your eyes to the color of your hair, um, secrets to diversity, all these things are trapped inside this code. And, uh, and some, of these, some of the genes that code for proteins and tissues that relate to disease are also trapped inside this code. Um, and we know some of them, and then we also don't know some of them. So there's a lot of unknowns still. And essentially what these companies are looking for is something called variation or polymorphism. And so variation is what makes you different from the average? What makes you different from what's kind of the baseline out there? And they'll provide you reports on things like disease risk. So does one person have an increased risk of developing certain disease compared to the average? Or maybe a decreased risk of developing certain disease compared to the average? They can also show you things like carrier status. So uh, does one person carry a certain gene that they might be able to pass on to their children? And if the, their partner also carries that gene, then they might have a child who has a certain disease or a certain defect. They can also tell you things about um, your nutrition. So there are certain genes that have kind of that react differently with different foods. And so you, your report might say that you should avoid certain foods because of allergies, or you might wanna eat more of something. And also things like athletic ability. There are now genes that are linked to things like uh, increased bone density, increased muscle mass, um, faster muscles, you know, uh, better, um, better heart, um, kind of stretching of the heart, 
uh, increased capacity for the lungs, things like that. So there's lots and lots of in interesting information, and so um, you would think that people would be jumping to discover these things about themselves, right? But they're not, and so the question is why? Well, you get to see headlines like this, and so your genome may have already been hacked. So this is fun when uh, uh, police detectives in California basically use the public genomic database to identify uh, a crime suspect. And these public databases are, there's a numerous ones and people basically donate their genomic information to a public database um, where anybody essentially can look it up, right? They do this with the hopes that somebody's going to come up with a treatment for their disease, not because of this. <laughs> And then there's also these kinds of things. So security breach at MyHeritage leaks 92 million users, right? So um, these types of cybersecurity attacks um, are very, very common in healthcare. And they're typically due to poor um, cyber vigilance, uh, poor cyber hy hygiene. So typically they could be prevented with better technology. So uh, over 700, 1,700, sorry, events in the U.S., over 160 million individuals affected. There's attacks attempted every few seconds on healthcare data. So this is actually a map of a cybersecurity center in Dallas where they can trace all the attacks that happen um, attacking Blue Cross information, which is uh, one of the major insurers in the U.S. And there has been, a, just in the U.S. alone, 525% increase in med device vulnerability. And so the reason for this is because everything is so, so connected now. Everything is online. Um, everything is uh, in the cloud. So it's very easy to actually attack these devices. The complexity of this technology is high, but security is typically thought of as kind of an afterthought, almost like a patch or a Band-Aid. And so these breaches happen regularly. MyFitnessPal is another one earlier this year. Uh, I was one of the users of MyFitnessPal, so I got one of those emails, hey, your data is probably somewhere in the, on the dark internet. Not in those words, but you know, there's nothing we can do. You might want to change your password now. Right? And so it's a little bit too late when you reach that point, because what are you going to do? Are you going to comb all the internet looking for your data? No, and you're not going to find it. It's on a dark web where most people can't reach. Right? And people are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars for these kind of healthcare data sets. So they're very valuable. So um, the other question is data ownership. Who actually owns your healthcare data? Well, these days it's really hard to tell because everything gets bought and sold regularly across the value chain. So at the patient level, the physician level, institution level, anything about you. Um, so things like which prescriptions uh, you, you get, uh, which physicians you see, what kind of tests you do, all this information gets sold regularly, uh, anonymized, of course, but there are people making money off this. And so if you're really interested um, in the history of where this came from and, and how healthcare data started getting monetized, this is a great book by Adam Tanner that I highly recommend. And so why would people want to own their genomic data, their healthcare data? Well, it's because it's valuable. So Pharma giant GSK just made $300 million, uh, th made a $300 million bet in 23andMe, our favorite genomics consumer company, right? So the reason for this is something called precision medicine. So precision medicine is, an, this is the technical definition, an emerging approach for disease treatment and, pre treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environments, and lifestyle. Basically, what it means is a way to treat people that's getting the right treatment to the right person at the right time for the right thing um, without, you know, um, with as little negative side effects as possible. And it's actually an amazing approach, and I strongly believe in it. So I don't see anything wrong with this model, right? I think it's, it's a much more effective way to treat people. If you think on the basic level, um, the really simple example is blood transfusions. So people can only get certain types of blood uh, from another person. That's because different proteins on their blood cells, based on their genetics, won't accept other blood cells. And so a person can get really sick, they can die if they get the, the wrong type of blood. You can also apply the same thing to diseases like cancer. So there are certain markers that are associated with certain cancers based on your genetics that you might be more or less susceptible to certain treatments. And so it's important to know those things. Rather than treating somebody with broad spectrum chemotherapy, which might make them very sick and might be super ineffective, you might want to know their genetics first. The issue comes from where does that data go? Um, how does a, a person know where their data goes? 
Do they decide on that? Typically, people are signing off their consent uh, for 23andMe to use their data in the ways that they want, but they're not always necessarily realizing what they're signing off. And so five years ago, somebody might have gotten this test done, and now their data is getting sold to pharma, and they had no idea that this was going to happen, right? And the other thing is that they actually don't get any of that nice 300 million, right? So they're effectively paying twice. They're paying for the kit for the diagnostic. And then once those drugs come out, they're going to have to pay again to get that treatment. So it's nice they're going to get this cool personalized treatment potentially, but they're going to be paying a lot of money for it. And they get no incentive for the fact that their data helped contribute to that. So in comes blockchain technology. And I'm going to only talk briefly about blockchain at a very high level because it's very complex technology. Um, the, the technical definition of blockchain, it is a persistent, transparent, public append-only ledger. This is one of the technical definitions. So persistent, transparent, public append-only ledger. You guys got that? <laughs> Makes sense? Yeah? Everyone's super clear on that? Um, essentially, it's a new way of, of recording data, and it came to prominence after the... Um, the financial crisis. So it was, it was mainly kind of rose um, after that and, and as a financial technology. But what it really means, let's try to break all this down. Persistent means it's constant, so it's unchanging. So you can't change the blockchain. Uh, transparent means it's explicit, it's there for everybody to see. Public means that it's actually available to everybody. To, if they want to see it, they can. Uh, append only means you can add information, but you cannot remove information from the blockchain. And a ledger is just the collection of records of final entries. So the simplest form is a, a financial accounting ledger, where you can see the, the last debit and credit that you had in the last balance. And this is what it was originally used for, so for finance. And what you have basically are these kind of records of information that are packaged into nice blocks of a certain size and chained together with something called a cryptographic hash reference, which really means it's a code that chains one block to the previous block. Okay? And essentially, what it has given us, this technology, is a new data structure. So it's a new way of storing um, digital assets, uh, records of physical assets. Um, one of the cool things about it is that it's decentralized, which means that record actually exists on multiple different computers. So there's no central point of failure like in a cloud or a regular standard database. So it's much harder to hack because you have to hack the majority of those computers where it's stored in order to actually get access or be able to do anything with it. And that's very computer intensive. So it's actually not worth it for the most part. And uh, it allows you to share peer-to-peer -peer directly with people because you can provide those private and public keys that Natalie was talking about. Same, same kind of thing as with a wallet. Essentially, you're providing a password to somebody to access your data. So it provides this underlying trust fabric for transacting, in our case, healthcare data and other information. And you can generate value from it. So for genomics data, it allows us to tackle some of those challenges um, with the storage and sharing of genomics data. So you can uh, keep sensitive information hidden. So if patients don't want to share their information with an insurance company, for example, if they're predisposed to things like alcoholism, they don't have to. And this is often what patients are worried about. Um, there's no issues of data provenance. You know exactly who the owner of the data is, where that data originated. There's an audit trail of all data access, so you know exactly who entered um, or who accessed that data set and for what reason and when. Um, and this is done with these private keys that, um, again, that Natalie was talking about, similar to crypto. Um, essentially, it's a password that you provide that it can be temporary, um, it can be a, a contract that expires after a certain amount of time, um, it could be one um, access or multiple access. And so you can share those passwords with the people that you want to share your data with. Um, and you can also incorporate things like patient automatic consent, um, and incentives. So it really allows to support better research and better medicine initiatives. And this is what we're doing at Shivam. So essentially what we're trying to do is build a global uh, genomics and healthcare data hub. And this, the idea is that uh, anybody can store and access their, their genomic data. They can control the access and they can generate value from that data. Um, and they can obtain health and lifestyle type information. So it, it's blockchain, but it also intersects other technologies. So things like uh, AI and down the road, 
uh, potentially IoT, if we can link it to that. Um, and what we want to do in the end is provide this open web marketplace where people can actually dock their apps and services on top of a blockchain-based platform. Any developer can dock essentially an app that can provide either an analysis of the genome or peripheral services, so for example, telemedicine, um, uh, ga gaining access to other fitness, healthcare apps, things like that. And then there's a whole uh, load of enterprise use cases for that data. Uh, but the, the point is that the patient, the user, controls all of that. And they get some sort of incentive for doing that. So one of the things that we want to be able to really do is to facilitate user engagement. Because user engagement in healthcare is also a challenge. right? So one of the things that patients report they really want to be able to use all these apps and services that are available to them now more and more and more is incentives. So more than anything, they want to be incentivized for using them. Of course, everybody wants something in return, right? So this is the idea with our omics token. So our token uh, is integral to the platform because it, it incentivizes people to do things like refer others, update their health information, provide their health information, provide consent, participate in studies, and so on and so forth, right? The other thing that we want to do is really enable this trust and security and be able to give patients con their control back. So um, trust and security is important because of everything that we've just seen that happens in the healthcare space. We want to be able to, to really eliminate some of those issues with the, with the security. And we can do that with the blockchain. And we want to be able to provide something to the user that generates value for them. Um, but one of the things that we have to always keep in mind is the users have to be engaged, the institutions have to be engaged, so everybody needs to be engaged in kind of driving these changes. So just to summarize, um, with digit the digitization of patient health comes greater responsibility to make platforms secure, enable ownership, simplify this data exchange. Blockchain technology is well suited um, to address some of these challenges. Uh, there are benefits to owning your healthcare and genomic data, so both healthcare benefits and monetary benefits, as you saw. And then everybody needs to, to be really involved in driving this change if we're really going to change the face of healthcare and the face of precision medicine um, away from some of the issues that we're seeing today. Um, and so if I can just leave you with one thought, if you're interested at all in getting to the space, um, getting into uh, entrepreneurship, getting into the startup life, uh, this is always the advice that I try to live by and, and give to people. So that's dream big and don't be afraid of your dreams and work hard to achieve them. Stay focused because people will derail you uh, without really necessarily trying. They will. Um, but also surround yourself with good people because you cannot do it alone in this kind of, in this kind of space, in this kind of world. Um, and so if anything at all resonates with you today, anything that I've said, I am hiring. We're hiring for a number of positions, so you can come and speak to me afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.